So my research group's interest is uh, metal microbe interactions on uh, various uh, applications and academic interests of uh, environmental as well as uh, antimicrobials. So if we have a metal challenge to a bacteria, the bacteria be killed or it can generate resistance. And sometimes that resistance is mediated through the metal, uh, a metal uh, being bioconverted to a, uh, a precipitant or a nanomaterial. So this kind of leads us to aspects of metals being uh, antimicrobials and uh, in the aspects of metal nanomaterials, uh, we've observed that we can get bacteria to produce the nanomaterials for applications of photo photonics, electronics, and of course, antimicrobial properties. And with regards to time today, I'm gonna to focus on the application of antimicrobial properties. Uh, why study this? We are in the antimicrobial resistance era. Uh, we're, go we're in the situation that many pathogens are resistant to the existing antibiotics. So we have a need for new antimicrobial materials. Metals are uh, toxic to bacteria in a number of ways. If you uh, take this cartoon, so it can be destroying the proteins through interaction with the proteins. You can generate reactive oxygen species. You can uh, uh, interact with the DNA. You can generate uh, damage to the cell membrane and cell wall or damage cell metabolism. You can also have uh, metal resistance bacteria and my cartoon here is a super bug, but uh, being protected by the silver bullets, but uh, there is no silver bullet. Uh, there's resistance to every metal, but if we make different formulations, we can have uh, better metal-based antimicrobials. And that's where we're thinking. So we can deliver our MBAs, our metal or metalloid-based antimicrobials, as solid metal alloys, metal ions or chelates, co-crystals, metal organic frameworks or nanomaterials. If we think about uh, our elements of the periodic table, which metals are more antimicrobial? Well, down here at the micromolar level, you have tellurium, arsenic, mercury, and then towards the millimolar scale, you have some of the other elements listed here. The underlying elements are those that are already more popularly used. They are, all these are active against pathogens and World Health Organization priority resistance strains. And it's nothing new to use metals as antimicrobials. They've been used since antiquity. The coinage elements, copper, silver, and, and gold were used since antiquity because the mariners would throw silver coins into uh, water barrels on ships to keep the water from falling. An interesting aspect of metals is they are incredibly synergistic when interacting with each other. So here's a cur curve, a growth curve of E. coli and uh, a well gr growing well, sublethal concentration of zinc, sublethal concentration of silver. Using each of these sublethal concentrations together, we see no growth at all. So using non-lethal concentrations together gives synergistic killing. Similarly, we see zinc with silver against Staphylococcus aureus, gold with silver, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Uh, looking at uh, the co-crystals, uh, this is a group uh, collaboration with a group in uh, Bologna, Italy, Dr. Braga's group. And this is a, 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 a uh, quaternary ammonia compound antiseptic with copper, the copper, the orange here, chlorines in yellow, and you get this crystal proflavin with zinc. And here we can see that if we mix the uh, copper and the proflavin, we get increased antimicrobial activity, specifically against the Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which didn't have much activity uh, without. So if we gain zinc here, you see the curve going up of increasing efficacy as we make different types of co-crystals. Uh, metal organic frameworks, uh, similar as well. Here we've been playing with cobalt imidazolates recently. And here's again the growth curve. Uh, without challenge and then challenge with uh, different uh, forms or frameworks of the moth giving different resistance. This is methicillin resistant Staph aureus and we have fairly good activity. And cobalt itself is not that antimicrobial, but in this moth, it is quite antimicrobial. Where do we see metal nanomaterials as antimicrobials used? 
We see it in the textile industry, which is actually a misuse of, of them. Uh, food packaging stability, cosmetic preservatives, biofouling, topical antiseptics, industrial cleaners, disease co uh, control coatings, uh, underlined items as ones we're trying to put applications forward in. Uh, what we find in many cases, the antimicrobial activity is greater with the nanomaterial than the metal alone, and I'm going to show you some data for that. So when it comes to metal nanomaterial synthesis, we have our classical methods of bottom-up and top-down and template approaches, playing with reducing agents, pH, pressure, temperature. But this isn't, uh, these are fairly harsh conditions, not very eco-friendly. So there's been a lot of uh, movement towards green metal nanomaterial synthesis uh, for less, so you can use less toxic reagents, but you can also use organic materials. This has been done with a variety of agricultural byproducts and waste, such as banana peels, tea leaves, things like that. And these are essentially a source of reducing agents, such as reducing sugars. And we see a lot in the literature and a little bit in applications of, uh, for silver and gold nanoparticle production, but this is difficult to control. So we've seen an increased interest in micro abuse, either bacteria or fungi, for nanoparticle production. Uh, in my group, we were actually studying um, bacteria for metal bioremediation processes to uh, clean up uh, uh, heavy metal pollution. What we found is some uh, metal res resistant bacteria working as a community could crystallize metals out of solution. So here's an example of copper crystals coming right out of the bacteria, the bacteria in the background. Here's silver crystals being produced and strontium crystals being produced from the background. So we thought we were thinking about this with regards to precious metal recovery at the time. But if we link the concept that many metal lines are antimicrobial, metal nanomaterials are antimicrobial, and some metal resistant bacterial can mineralize, mineralize metal ions, can we use metal resistant environmental bacteria to take metal pollutants and convert to useful antimicrobial materials? In other words, can bacteria produce good nanomaterials as good as chemists? So this is a collaboration with groups in University of Verona, University of Bologna in Italy, as well as groups here in uh, University of Calgary uh, with some excellent graduate students, Elena, Alessandro, Greta, uh, Martina, and uh, postdoctoral fellows. So here's where it kind of began 2014. We were playing around with this photosynthetic bacteria and we were able to make tellurium nanorods quite effectively by playing with the physiology. This is essentially giving the bacteria different food sources to generate a unique physiology. We also added an electron uh, conduit in um, molecule law zone, and we were able to get just by optical, uh, just, uh, 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 optical analysis, higher yields of the nanomaterial. And these are about uh, 50 to 250 nanometer length rods. <clears throat> so that really confirmed that we should be able to do this. And uh, the idea is we want to look at calcogen resistant bacteria. In Canada or North America, we have a selenium pollution problem with our coal mining on our Eastern Rockies. We also have a lot of tellurium polluted sites. So can we use calcogen resistant bacteria as biofactories to make nanoparticles? So we isolated some bacteria from variety of polluted sites. And uh, this bacteria that we're, we were using for organic bioremediation and Alberta oil sands, uh, pollutant remediation. Uh, but it also turned out to be very highly metal resistant. So we're gonna play with that. So I'm gonna show you very quickly some examples of this. So here's a Bacillus mycoides where it's selenite. And you can see the cultures here as we grow unchallenged and challenged. And after 48 hours, we have a very red density and you can see really nice uniform uh, selenium nanoparticles around the bacteria uh, at that time point. Uh, it, when we extract them away, uh, we called these uh, selenium uh, uh, nanostructures embedded in, in uh, organic material. Um, so uh, you can see there's a bit of a, a fog around it, and you'll see other uh, conditions that there's a fog, but we have uh, uh, good polydispersity and good zeta potentials associated with them, but about equal to the chemical nanoparticles that we synthesized. 
a different bacteria being produced. Here's the bacteria, here's their nanoparticles. Uh, and uh, uh, nice distribution of these particles and good zeta potential for stability. Here's another bacteria. This bacteria was kind of strange. We found that higher concentrations gave smaller nanoparticles than, uh, uh, or than the smaller concentration. We didn't get quite as good stability of uh, zeta potential, but uh, they were still quite useful. And again, this is this fog I was referring to. For this uh, BCP1 strain, we have a, we've worked a lot with this. It's really exciting that we can make tellurium nanorods and tellurium nanoparticles. And here's the bacteria. And this is just a graph of uh, concentration and time where we can see with time, we can see nanoparticle, nanorods being produced inside the cell versus a few nanoparticles inside the cell. And we can actually uh, get a fairly linear relationship or a nice relationship between time and concentrations to predict, to generate these uh, nanorods with uh, uh, good accuracy of size. They are very good quality. They're very electrical conductive, nice uh, diffraction pattern here. When we tried to make selenium nanoparticles initially, uh, it was a mess. Uh, there's some material produced outside the cell uh, and didn't work very well. Uh, with time, though, we were able to uh, figure out how to play with the physiology and the growth conditions, and we were able to get uh, quite nice rods and particles uh, extracted and be able to select the physiology for one or the other. Uh, my new graduate student is trying to do silver with this bacteria, and uh, we're quite excited because we were able to make both cubes and nanoparticles. So the nanoparticles in the fog here these are actually quite antimicrobial and the cubes, they have potential as a photosensitizer for ROS production. So let me show you some of the antimicrobial data uh, just to prove that they are. So there's the, uh, the selenite, the free oxyanion of selenium, and then the nanoparticle. Planktonic bacteria are the free swimming bacteria you might have in, in water. And biofilm is the form of bacteria that is surface attached as such as the plaque on your teeth are a biofilm and they are more resistant to antibiotics. So this is the real challenge. Can we find new antimicrobials that are able to kill off biofilm? So here you see the biogenic selenium nanoparticles have the ability to kill it off. When we look at Pseudomonas aeruginosa and Staph aureus, we see a difference of the killing of the selenium nanoparticles. And these were based on different times. So they are slightly different in size with the salt, smaller nanomaterial being more antimicrobial. Here's an applicational moving towards where for a medical indwelling device for hip, uh, uh, joint implants and uh, hip, hip replacements and things like that, that leads to a lot of nosocomial infections. And so we have hydroxyapatite coated surface, which is for bone material to interact with. And we want to prevent a biofilm forming on this surface. And what we, he we have here, we've compared uh, chemically synthesized nanoparticles in various ways with biogenic nanoparticles. And you can see that the biogenic nanoparticles were able to inhibit both Pseudomonas aeruginosa and Staph aureus from forming a biofilm on these uh, medical implants, whereas the chemical ones could not do that at all. So this leaves us trying to figure out uh, why. And one of the aspects is that fog around the particles. So we have a selenium core we, from our biophysics analysis. It looks like the core is the same between the chemical and biogenic. We have an inner uh, capping layer and an outer associated layer. We can exchange that material with different detergents and surfactants. And if we do too much, of course, we'll get aggregation, we lose the stability we can exchange the surface for different activity as well. Uh, we remove this outer layer in the cap, we actually find that we have really good electrosteric repulsion. Where's that coming from? It's coming from the biochemist, bio molecules from the living organism. So proteins, DNA, peptides, metabolites, lipids, polysaccharides are all present during the synthesis and would become associated and we actually noticed that some of the proteins are actually involved in the synthesis of the nanoparticles as oxidoreductase is involved. So these are gonna be 
looking like this electrostatic repulsion. And it's our feeling that perhaps this biomolecule cap facilitates the better interaction with the bacteria, which allows it to have greater antimicrobial activity. Another aspect of the cap, uh, so we're gonna grow selenium nanomaterial all the same way, but in multiple different selenium different organisms. We're analyzing the cap material. We have different carbohydrate content. We have different protein content, different lipid content. This leads to differences in hydrodynamic diameter growing exactly in the same way in the same uh, energy sources. Zeta potential, all quite reasonably good, but different again. And the polydispersity is different again as we have different capping biomolecular composition. And we can control that biomolecular composition by our growth conditions. So our approach is to remove the metal pollutant by generating useful material. So we call this bioremediation coupled with bioconversion. We're able to control what nanomaterial the bacteria make. Uh, we're starting to really optimize the specific, for specific applications, yet we're still learning a lot about the biochemical mechanisms behind the nanomaterial formulations. And as we understand this more, it'll feed back to uh, the applications and the type of nanomaterial. So we believe we have a good approach to green nanomaterial synthesis. And in that aspect, when we compare to chemical, we have these two additional parameters that we have the bacterial physiology state as well as the choice of our cell factory to use. Bacteria microbes make up 98% of the species on the planet, which gives us a huge rainforest of possible organisms to produce nanomaterial. So we've just, we haven't even, uh, it's not even a drop in the bucket. It's barely a microliter of our bucket to, that we've explored at this point. So thank you very much. I just want to acknowledge again, Elena and Alessandro, my new student, uh, Nikhil. Roberto was one, uh, the first uh, postdoc I worked with to try, see if we can do this. And then Greta, Alessandro, uh, Sylvia Lampus, a collaborator at the uh, University of Verona now. Uh, it's been a great project. Thank you very much.